Well, everybody, thank you very, very much indeed for joining us. Um, uh, Adrian and I are talking. Adrian is the director of um, the beautiful Salisbury Museum here. And um, Kate, our chief operational officer, operations officer is online as well. They are the team that run this place so beautifully. They're the team who've got it all ready and coming up to open again. And they're the team that have so kindly put on this exhibition of Richard Chopping's work. And um, what, what we have here is um, a celebration of the life um, of Chopping, who uh, lived uh, in uh, London and Essex, uh, but spent quite a lot of time in Wiltshire. And we, in a way, maybe a little bit tenuously, like to have a Wiltshire connection with the things that we put on here at the museum. I should have said at this stage, I'm lucky enough to be um, uh, acting as chair of trustees here at the museum, uh, which gives me the joy of working with these guys and sitting in this beautiful museum at the moment. But our tenuous connection here was that Fleming lived at one time uh, in Wiltshire and he is buried here in Wiltshire. And I was talking to Adrian, we were, we were talking about what we were going to do as the museum reopened, because don't forget, not only has this city, like everybody else, suffered from COVID as everything that's been going on here, but it, here and the museum and lots of shops and lots of businesses here had only just recovered from Novichok. So people don't realise how terrible that was, and it's still ongoing, and people have lost their businesses. Yeah, their livelihoods, their homes, masses of stuff's gone on. So the sales here and everything just plummeted and then just got back on their feet. They were doing such a great job, crash. We were talking and Adrian said, you know, if only we had something that was more contemporary. And we were kind of joking and Adrian said, yeah, like the Bond film. And I thought, well, hold on, actually, there is something here. So we had a conversation and going backwards and forwards when lockdown allowed, we ended up getting the stuff together. And, and this is how this exhibition has come about. I was taught by Richard Chopping. I came from Wiltshire. I was lucky enough to get a place at the Royal College of Art. And about my first day there, um, Richard Chopping got on stage with all the different professors and teachers and people who were in a way selling uh, their courses that we might sign up for the um, extra courses. He got on stage and was so badly behaved that one lady had to be helped off the stage, dabbing her eyes as she burst into tears because he, rather than talking about all the joys, he just told us, the whole story as it was, all the terrible things. And he just said, I will teach you about life, beautiful, wonderful detail of lovely, salacious life. And if you want to sign up to it, come along and sign up. And it took me about 10 seconds that I was signed up. And uh, from then onwards, we became friends. He became my mentor for a long time. And all the way through um, to his death, I was very lucky to have 27 years of an incredible friend and just the most amazing stories, anecdotes, etc. a lot of which we're going to share tonight. He, of course, um, I say of course, not necessarily everybody knows, but he is very well known for these covers um, for Ian Fleming. And we're going to go into discuss that in a bit later on. It's very important for us to say here that whilst we have Fleming and we're talking about the original Bond illustrator, we are covering 50 years of his working life. And, and he just did so much. And we've got three galleries here, three small galleries, and his work is very small. So it suits this, um, this museum perfectly. And, he started off with a lot of botanical work um, and he moved on to the uh, Bond work and he did a lot of trompe l'oeil work. Forgive me for saying the obvious trompe l'oeil, trick of the eye, the three-dimensional work. It's very, very photorealistic work. And so this isn't all about um, Bond. In fact, there's a lot more of the other stuff. So we need to be very clear with people and not, not um, be deceiving anybody. When I talk about Richard Chopping, I will say Dickie quite often because he was known as Dickie Chopping. Uh, I can't have this talk without mentioning Dennis Worth Miller, who was his life partner. And um, Dennis died two years after Dickie in 2010. We're not going to go into Dennis's life here, um, other than to say that um, together they were pretty special, pretty special hellraisers, um, very colourful life. Uh, those that know um, of them. It, you, know, you, you just you couldn't but love them but they were so bad at times and they were so good at other times here is a picture of Dennis uh, in the studio that he took over from Walter Sickert in Fitzrovia Dickie first met him and he saw this um, beautiful statue of Mercury he was saying how lovely it was so Dennis poured uh, several bottles of his aftershave over it and set light to it which Dickie thought was probably the most hedonistic exciting thing he'd ever seen and um, I think that's probably when his heart went in that direction. 
they very, very kindly uh, left me and a co-executor as co-beneficiaries of their estate. So 2008, Dickie died, uh, 2010, Dennis died. By 2011, after probate and things, I became uh, the owner of a lot of stuff. And this was a lot of stuff. There was just so much. I knew that they had a studio uh, at the back of their house that they hadn't been in for a long, long time. And I was really keen on um, just seeing all of the stuff that was there, but I had no idea how amazing it was. And I was very lucky um, through friends to be introduced to um, the then directors of the Tate, Tate Britain, who came to see me and just said, this is actually a really important archive. You've got to be very, very careful. And it was so great getting that advice early on and making sure they had acid proof papers and how to keep other things and, and get things all in the right place. Um, poor Mr. Chopping, I even have his teeth. So, you know, as we all get older, I am making sure my clear out, make sure that no person like me will be sitting giving a lecture in Salisbury with a copy of my dentures. So these guys, if we skip forward, um, in the late 1930s, they were in Fitzrovia, London's Bohemia. They were absolute, like the sort of um, matinee stars by this stage. And they, they, they were fighting against it. They didn't have money. They were, they were living as artists. Everything was a struggle, but they were having a hell of a time. It was a really good time. There's a picture of them stepping out, the Cafe Royal, you know, the cocktail book that was one of the things that I found. They, they were there most of the time. They met other people there. They had a fantastic time. And they had uh, a set of friends, a bit like the who's who of uh, pre-war, during war and post-war. John Minton here was a very close friend. Dennis was incredibly good to him and saved him from suicide a couple of times and just missed on the last occasion when um, John Minton killed himself in 57, but Dennis was on his way and um, they were enormously fond of him. Another real wonderful character, Nina Hamlet, the Queen of Bohemia. Uh, here is a letter which we have here in the show and the playing cards that she sent to Dickie, to Richard Chopping and said uh, she wanted him to turn these into a trompe l'oeil which he did. He has wonderful memories and the, and the stories about her. Well, it, it's a bit too easy to tell the stories about as she started going downhill. She drank masses and she was just equally badly behaved, but she had been such a wonderful artist and her work is just fantastic. And she, um, afterwards, she was a little bit bad and he tells stories about how she'd be drinking gin and she'd be sick in a handbag and then just mop her, wipe her mouth, shut the handbag and continue drinking gin. But they were pretty taken by her. Um, she, she was a great friend of Walter Sickert, so she came into the studio every day as if she still belonged there. Other friends um, here, we have um, uh, Robert Cahoon, um, Robert McBride, and here Yankel Adler. Uh, the two Roberts, again, notorious hellraisers um, from Soho, from Scotland, uh, came down with Yankel Adler. He'd, uh, had to leave Europe and he brought masses of things with him from Europe from rubbing shoulders some of the most amazing people in Europe and these guys were um, the, the, the top of the um, game in Soho. Adler lived in, then moved to Wiltshire and died in Wiltshire here. The two Roberts um, sadly um, went the way of a few of the others and um, uh, there was a, a hell of a lot of drinking and um, Robert uh, Cahoon drank himself to death in Islington and Robert McBride was run over by a taxi in Dublin as he came out of a bar. Now in all this hell raising and things, John Gielgud was on the periphery, but he was also being very well stalked by Dickie. Dickie was rather obsessed with, by Gielgud and would get his sketchbooks out and would go and sit deliberately trespassing in John Gielgud's property, <laughs> hoping to be arrested and dragged into the house and maybe given a gin and tonic. Sadly for him, it never happened. Um, and there are a few other anecdotes about Gielgud, but I don't think we're going to tonight, particularly since they involve false teeth. Then, of course, Francis Bacon. He became the best friend of Dickie and Dennis for 45 years. And um, I think from getting onto this slide, what we can say is fasten your seatbelts from now on because things changed quite a lot. They met uh, Bacon when they uh, first left London in the Blitz, which we'll talk about in a moment and uh, Dennis became so close to him, but um, it was a pretty bloody relationship. So leaving Fitzrovia, they uh, headed down to Suffolk and Essex. Dickie had come from this area and he had a, 
a cottage called Daffodil Cottage that he had rented for two and six a week. And he had always had this dream that it'd be somewhere he'd es escape to from London. And um, when the bombs and the phony war and the real war and everything that's going on, they decided to leave. Nina Hamlet basically told them they were a couple of wusses and that they shouldn't be doing this. In actual fact, they were quite right because Sickert Studio that they lived in uh, had it, was the center of uh, where a bomb landed and was absolutely blown to smithereens. So chances are they wouldn't have been with us if they did stay in London. But they, they went to Daffodil Cottage they were working for Daffodil Cottage. And then they were introduced by a friend um, called Joan Warburton, who told them to cycle over and meet her friends in the um, bottom right here, Cedric Morris and Arthur Lett Haynes, who ran the um, East Anglian School of Painting and Drawing. And these are paintings from students there and Cedric's paintings of this beautiful uh, building and the grounds uh, near Hadley. And they went over, they met Cedric and Lett, and they suddenly realized that Bohemia had moved from Fitzrovia and was here in Hadley. There were people in long gowns, there were peacocks on the lawns, there were uh, people playing music. It, it was just everything they had had in London suddenly was here in the country and just a few miles from them. So before long, they enrolled as students. They didn't have any money. And Cedric and Millette said, well, look, you can be bottle washer and gardener and um, you come here. And if you work, you can be students. They did this. And here in the bottom left was a fellow student called uh, Lucian Freud. Dickie had met him before when he worked on an interior magazine in London, had gone with the photographer to cover the Freud's uh, Hampstead house. Uh, he didn't like him when he first met him there. He liked him even less when Freud came here and was a star pupil in uh, the East Anglian School. Dickey was developing a, a style. He was doing a lot of landscape painting. They were getting out and about and um, just really enjoying everything around them. It's, it's very weird to be saying that during the time of the war, they were enjoying themselves. There are a lot of stories about all the horrors that were going on. They, they were totally aware of what was going on and what was happening to all of their friends. But they were lucky enough, I think a bit like some people can feel in, in COVID and you, know, you can see the hell that some people are going through and it makes you appreciate more when you're not going through it yourself. And that, that's certainly what they began to believe. Chopping's work was interesting at this stage. It, it was sort of caricature, um, poking fun, uh, caricatures, and but it was all oil painting, but incredibly detailed. It started this thing really going into detail and these started doing very well. And a couple of galleries offered him shows and, and the work was taken and, and he was really happy with it. And he, he's, whilst pursuing it, he was also getting some um, work for, from um, uh, for books, for some book publishing, which we'll show in a moment. At Benton End, while he was doing paintings like that, Cedric Morris painted Dickey. So there is Dickey and what he looked like. And there is, uh, the painting that Cedric Morris did of Dickey. I've not been able to find a colour one, I'm afraid. So I've only got a black and white one. Cedric Morris um, clearly liked Dickey very much. However, here is the painting that Lucian Freud did of Dickey. <laughs> and as Dickey said to me, uh, he thinks probably that sums up who liked him and who didn't like him. Uh, although I think he'd be very pleased to know that sold for 1.4 million pounds a couple of years ago. Then, in the archive, I found this picture on the left here, uh, which Dickie has taken, and it is Cedric Morris here painting Lucian Freud there. I, I'm so non-academic, non-historian, I thought that was an old lady. Uh, of course, it is that very famous painting that is in Tate Britain of uh, Lucian Freud, painted in Benton End Art School by Cedric Morris. And Maggie Hamlin told me this is a really, um, that was a very good name drop that I just got in very spontaneous there. The, 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 that this is very rare because Cedric never liked to be painted, um, photographed when he's painting apparently. But so that is absolutely great. While we're on Benton End, um, there was a painting uh, that Dickie and Dennis had that was, uh, they told me by Lucy and Freud, they put it into Christie's in uh, 1985. It went into the catalogue, printed up, and then Freud denied that it was his. And their hatred and fight with Freud 
took a few steps forward, went even worse. And one of the things they asked me to do was, uh, after their deaths, was to take this forward and prove that Lucien Freud had done it. And with great thanks to the BBC Fake or Fortune with Philip Mould and Fiona Bruce, and five months work and a lot of work by some very, very talented people, this picture now of John Jameson, the whiskey heir, is now a fully um, fledged member of the catalogue raisonné of um, Lucien Freud. Th this is the kind of thing that we have in the show here, is the kind of thing that Chopping did uh, as he got older. He didn't want a lot of things to go, to be lost, a lot of his memories. He wanted a biography. He tried to write a bi biography himself many times, and he focused a lot on the Victorian family and things like that, which publishers just weren't picking up on. But he would download things, and a lot of this came my way. And this was basically reasons to hate Lucy and Freud, and he downloaded this at 4.50 in the morning. I awoke at 3 a.m., so he spent one hour 50 on why he hates Lucy and Freud here. And they're lovely, some of the things here are, are lovely, and I, I know answers to a lot of them. Other ones like number five, the egg cup episode, I'm dying to find out. But what's great about this expression here is a lot of the stuff needs the forensic minds of the people who are going to be involved. And we're meeting so many great people who are coming through here. They're telling me things that I didn't know. And we're putting two and two together. And forensically, we can start getting things uh, to fit together. Interesting thing here is he's talking about how annoyed he was when Lucien Freud came to his painting and finished off his painting. And uh, I, I, I don't know. I'm not, I don't know which painting that was or where else. Lots of things like that that we will find out. So much hasn't been discovered from this archive. I mentioned the children's books. Kathleen Hale was a very good friend at the East Anglian School in Benton End. She's famous for Orlando the Marmalade Cat. And this is a picture of her in there in Dickie and Dennis's house. And she loved the work that she saw that Dickie was doing for children's books. He, he was just pitching things, but he didn't really know where to go with them. And she introduced him to Noel Carrington, who was the brother of Dora Carrington, the famous Bloomsbury artist. And Noel Carrington was an agent for Penguin, and he had set up Puffin. And he, Noel Carrington saw this first book that Chopping had done, at this stage, she was called Gwladys, G-W-L-A-D-Y-S, Gwladys the All-British Giraffe. She turned forward into Gladys, and here's the family of Gladys, the All-British Giraffe. Carrington loved these, was really interested, and started extra commissions with Chopping. So Chopping then got onto um, the butterflies of Britain. This was his job to basically find as many of the butterflies that existed in, uh, in, in the British Isles to draw and paint their habitats and to uh, get every single uh, caterpillar, butterfly, etc. Th this did enormously well and it was in hardback, paperback, but during the war, when people couldn't get hold of books, it, it went on to the school curriculum and it just sold and sold. And he did enormously well out of this. Even as the days when he was um, you know, at the end of his life, he was still getting royalties from this thing. It, it was incredibly good. And here are some of the proofs. And we've got a lot of printer's proofs here because in those days, proofs would be physically signed by the artist and then sent back to the printers. And we've got lots of these. And here are some of the proofs and some of the pages from Butterflies of Britain. This was from 1943. They'd be working in Daffodil Cottage. The lights had to be turned out and they'd have all the windows blacked out and they'd have kerosene lamps and all the zinc plates they were working into kept getting their breath on them because it was so cold. They'd have to go and get water from a pump outside. It sounds a bit idyllic, but it also sounds a bit hellish, I have to say. The, um, the next commission after Butterflies of Britain was to do a book on spiders. And the man who had written this sounded pretty eccentric and uh, Chopping started doing the, the spiders and started this great interest in insects. So I will now hint at, of course, we know that flies come into the bond covers, but so he got his big interest in insects after the butterflies. This is one of the drawings, but he was very particular, Chopping was very particular about um, what happens and how the print process was going to go. And they just could not register the eight legs. Every single time one color would be just out of sync and he rejected it and he, he couldn't do it. But another of his problems was that unfortunately he turned a book over and squashed one of his um, 
a favourite specimens that he'd been lent by the author of the book, and he had to get hold of the author and explain to him he'd actually killed the spider. But the author was, as I said, pretty eccentric and told him to roast it and eat it because that species apparently were pretty nutty, and um, the nutty taste was one of his favourite things. So then the next, in 1944, uh, Dickie started on these small books for Bantam, and uh, there was the tailor and his mouse, the old woman and the peddler, wildflowers and birds of Britain. They're pretty, pretty primitive. But again, this is the war, paper is difficult to get hold of. And these are the proofs that we've got here. We've, we've got the artist's originals. And um, fascinating way he's marked them up and the way the typography is done is just extraordinary. And um, this then led on to uh, another big hit of theirs in 1946. Dennis Worthmiller with Dickie did Heads, Bodies and Legs. And this was a book that came in paper and people would cut through the book, through the heads, through the bodies, uh, and then you could mix them uh, around. And it was ideally, it was meant to be a child's book, but of course it became enormously popular. And then uh, it was taken to America, transatlantic uh, publishers took it over there and it was incredibly successful. And it's beautiful, absolutely lovely, but really, really um, one of my favorite things there. So that then led on to, in 1946 as well, chopping, writing, and illustrating a book called Mr. Postlethwaite's Reindeer. And this got a BBC radio uh, series that came out with it, where he read the story as well. And it just things were beginning to look up. It just, things were happening. He was really, he realized that his career was potentially going to go in the right way if he played all his cards right. He, he produced a few other books. The, these are illustrations that we have here in the show from Father Time. And another one was called Animals Night Entertainment, where they, um, he and Kathleen Hale, Orlando fame, went into London Zoo and they would paint uh, and illustrate the animals in London Zoo. There's in one of the diaries he writes about coming back on the bus and how embarrassed they were because one of the lions had urinated and sprayed urine all over them. And they were sitting on the bus absolutely stinking as they came home. But I can see it was well worth it because there's a really beautiful little drawing there of the lion. This didn't actually make it into publication. Uh, and then uh, Dickie started on a um, child's magazine. In Russia, there were child's magazines being produced at the time, very, very colorful and very successful. And Noel Carrington said, yeah, why don't you get all your friends together and do this? And one of the things that I inherited is this absolutely amazing uh, manuscript written by Stephen Spender and hand corrected by Stephen Spender called um, Pierino the Unicorn. It's never been published. And when I contacted uh, uh, Stephen Spender's son, Matthew, he said to me, yeah, he, his father wrote this for him, but he, he's never seen it, he'd never read it. It's absolutely incredible, but for a children's story, it, it, the mind boggles because it's about a beautiful fluffy little unicorn and there are lots of other lovely animals and a few you know, children and things. By about page five, they've all been obliterated, shot and killed or hunted. And it, it's just, it's extraordinary, but it is absolutely of a time. And it's um, a, another of those things that is so amazing about this, this archive that just keeps giving and giving. However, in their lives, 1945, 44, 45 disaster strikes. Without putting too fine a point onto it, Dennis Worth Miller is now writing from Wormwood Scrubs. Dickie has to leave where he's living, News of the World, run stories on it, and everything that was going so well in his career suddenly starts backfiring. And this was a charge of gross indecency. So while this has been going on, they've been going back and forwards and looking at a house in Wivenhoe on the estuary, beautiful estuary of a working uh, village in, uh, in, in on the Essex estuary on the Colne. They couldn't, they saw this house, they couldn't move into it uh, because there was a torpedo factory nearby and there was a ban because of the World War II restrictions. And uh, they had to wait a while before they could go there, but it was an ideal outcome where they needed to get away because the newspaper stories that were harassing them and this was where they're going to make uh, a new start and this the white building there is is the storehouse it was an old sale uh how sale uh warehouse it had been a rich merchant's house many years before it had been a pub huge open space the kind of thing that decades later we we're all fighting about to get into they did this in 1944 45 and in the storehouse, they had a thing called the Visitor's Book, 
And the visitor's book is pretty amazing. It's everybody who is anybody is in there. And um, I just have to point out to uh, Tom Cull, who I know is uh, with us tonight. There is his father's name signed there, quite close to Mr. Bacon, who is signed there. And there's, here we have Kahuna McBride down there, but it, it is just um, everybody. Francis Partridge, the Bloomsbury diarist there, goes on and on and on, uh, and from, from as soon as they got in there. The archive, and again, stuff that we have here, beautiful postcards sent from the trips in Italy that the two Roberts did, signed from the Roberts, and then John Minton had gone with them, writing there, Dickie and Dennis, were invited to go over there. Um, Dennis went at one stage and, and joined them once. Then they were drawing and boozing and behaving badly. Humphrey Spender, this is a much older picture of Humphrey Spender, but he was a very uh, good friend. I put this in here because this is what I think is a beautiful painting of Salisbury Plain, that uh, he, a, a war painting that um, Spender did uh, of Salisbury Plain, so seemed very relevant to tonight. But he was a, a very close friend and obviously the brother of Stephen Spender, who was a friend of theirs. Another mentor and good friend is John Nash and Christine Nash, and a nice cat that obviously moved at the wrong moment because they'd gone to tea with the Nashes. They, the letters that we have from the Nashes, they were absolutely looking out for these two young men and, and introducing them to the all right people, bringing uh, people to see their work, getting them exhibitions. And a lot of the work that was coming out of here featured boats and the windows of their of their beautiful house that looked onto the estuary. This is a picture that I took from inside the house. You can see that the, quite often there are mud flats there. It, it's just so lovely, the fact that this is, what I love about Wyvern Hoare is it, it's so, it still has that feel of a, of a um, working uh, port. This was the inside, this is after their death. This was the inside, as you can see, you look straight through. Imagine if the bow window is, um, at the front of this picture and you're looking through there all the way through to the kitchen so they just had stairs that went through and it was just like this big warehouse space all in wood the next thing that happens in chopping's life is what i'm calling the penguin saga with alan lane 44 to 51 francis partridge here the bloomsbury diarist as we say married rafe partridge rafe partridge had been married to dora carrington as we mentioned before this all starts adding up there is chopping there this is in Wivenhoe, outside the storehouse. Uh, Rafe had lived with Dora in a house in Wiltshire called Hamspray House here in Wiltshire. And uh, after Dora Carrington uh, had shot herself in the garden in 1932, they'd had the house since 1924, Rafe married Francis and uh, they, they lived in Hamspray House. What I love about Hamspray House letterheads when she writes to Chopping, when it's a fine day, she uses this little head. When it's raining, she uses this letter head. The burn marks that you will see <laughs> fairly consistently coming through in this presentation will be explained quite soon. Now here we have what might apparently look like some beautiful little flowers. These are the beautiful little flowers that nearly bankrupted uh, Penguin, the imprint called Penguin. Alan Lane commissioned Francis Partridge and uh, Chopping to paint every single uh, flower of the UK. He was walking across Victoria Square with chopping. He said, I want a blue pimpernel. I want a scarlet pimpernel. I want every damn pimpernel. I want everything in the UK. It, it was going to be 22 volumes. Every page would have a picture of a flower on it. They really got going on this. It would have bankrupted Penguin. And Lane was such a tough guy. He, he just did not want to give up. And it took Miss Frost, his director, to actually get, um, these two together and explained to them that this thing wasn't going to happen. And they were incredibly sad because they worked for seven years climbing up hills, falling into bogs, going across rivers, doing everything all through every single weather. But the interesting thing is there were two copies, one chopping had and one was with cows, the printer. And we have one of the copies here in the museum uh, to uh, show what was happening in that time. But again, very interesting to watch that the photorealism is coming out in his work here. We have the letters going backwards and forwards. These two actually may not be relevant, but Alan Lane, it's lovely just seeing, you know, with something as amazing and so big as Penguin, to be holding the letters you know, written and signed by Alan Lane. They say how funny it was, in hindsight, to be sitting there and be sacked by Alan Lane as they slipped down into these leather seats in his office and only to find out the leather seats had actually been bought in an auction after the war and they'd been shipped over from Germany. They'd actually graced 
the officers of um, Hermann Goering before, and they felt that there was some, something actually a bit ironic and maybe even appropriate in that. So, as mentioned before, the Triumvirate, the Bacon Friendship, this started around 1947 and um, continued until Bacon's death in 92. Here is a very <laughs> typical Maudlin picture of a Soho restaurant, a few bottles down the tracks here. I had experiences of having uh, dinner with them and if Bacon couldn't get the uh, waiter's attention, he'd pick up that bottle that's on the table there and he'd throw the empty at the waiter <laughs> to try and get his attention. But if the waiter came straight away, he would get a 50 pound note put in his hand and an apology and just more wine would be ordered. And here, interestingly, is a, a Bacon painting that's photographed in the studios in their house, the storehouse, Dickie and Dennis's house. They shared studios, so that here, here comes another very fascinating bit about who worked with who and how they influenced each other and things like that, but also how Dennis was living in the shadows of such a very, very successful artist. Masses of letters inherited. Dick, Dickie would come up to London and give me things and just say, for God's sake, hide these um, Dennis's in a rage with Francis, and he's just setting light to anything that's got Francis' name on it. So masses of stuff would, would come up, all the holiday snaps and things like that. When Bacon was in Wivenhoe, he even bought a little cottage in Wivenhoe for his studio, but he still shared the Dickie and Dennis's studio most of the time. Because there weren't any casinos in Wivenhoe, they made sure that they um, catered for it themselves and they got their own little wheel in there. And there, there are just wonderful stories about them slipping over into their paintings and having Macintoshes covered in oil paint and going down to the pub and sitting in the pub. And, you know, uh, Francis Bacon is stuck on the back of the seat of the pub. Here, is another portrait of Dickie, and this is these two are done by Bacon, and uh, Dickie would mumble under his breath, "Well, he made me look as ugly as possible," but uh, they're pretty impressive, I think. And Bacon was very generous with paintings, and there were a few paintings given to Dickie and Dennis. There are wonderful stories of when they'd had a row, and he'd left a painting in the house. They Dickie and Dennis would just go to it with standing lights and rip it up, wake up in the morning, feel embarrassed, and have to hide it under the floorboards and. and Bacon didn't even blink an eyelid, didn't say anything. As we all have our holiday snaps, it's pretty amazing that their holiday snaps included one of the world's most famous artists with a handkerchief over his head in the back of their car. This was in the south of France where there was another rather loud punch up. And restaurants all over the country would host them. Very good behavior, I think here, although I'm not sure what we can read into that. No, Dickie still looks happy, I think that's okay. 1952 and 56, Bacon did something very kind for Dickie. After the Alan Lane and Penguin book had been stopped, Dickie had all these pictures of flowers. So he walked around uh, the galleries trying to sell these pictures, trying to see if galleries would take them. And Bacon introduced him to Erica Browson, who ran the Hanover Gallery and was um, to be uh, Bacon's agent. And uh, it, he, he put on, she gave him a show in 1952, and there was another show in 1957. By the time of 57, he was working on these trompe l'oeils, and we talked about insects, and here we have the photorealism coming, and the style that was becoming very much his, his own come out here. And um, the press was just incredible, absolutely amazing. It, he, he was in all the national newspapers, and he shared this show, the first show, with Francis Bacon. There's another extraordinary thing that a lot of people haven't realized. Francis Bacon and Richard Chopping have a show together. Here's one of my favorite trompe l'oeils, and these have those playing cards that we showed earlier um, Nina Hamlet had sent uh, to Dickie. But again, you just have to look so closely at these with a magnifying glass. It's not big, it's, the detail is phenomenal. And another two here, fruit becomes quite a popular theme in his, um, in his work. And the three monkeys up above there in the trompe l'oeil. And quite often there is a pin, with a little message there. I want people coming to this exhibition here to be really, really clever with their detective work. There's so many little messages that he hides in his work. And when we come to the Bond things, we will talk about that. There are some lovely ones here. And um, this one, uh, my friend Paul Fincham, who was a friend of Dickie and Dennis's, this was in Paul's collection, um, and this is in the show here. Look again, we have the fly here, we have some of the preliminary drawings of this, and we have some of the other artichoke drawings. But if you note here, there's also this wood is appearing at the back. So we've got wood and flies, and 
as a lot of people will know, because I know we've got the glitterati of the um, Bond world um, in this call. In fact, I'm pretty embarrassed with the brains and the um, creativity that we have got in the audience tonight. But here are things that will go over to Bond and become quite a big bit of the Bond uh, franchise. And this, when I inherited this, is tiny. I just thought, oh yeah, printer's proof. And then I looked at it, no, he's actually painted this. And I, it was just kind of discarded. It is absolutely lovely. I love it. Uh, more trompe l'oeil, more of the wood, as you see. Uh, and then we have a fly coming here, more of the wood, long-tailed mouse, uh, more playing cards, more fruit and wood. And this led to a meeting with Mr. Fleming because uh, Francis Bacon was friends with Anne Fleming. Anne Fleming came and had a private view of the work that Chopping had done. She interviewed him. He felt um, totally embarrassed. She, he said uh, yeah, she, was, she absolutely didn't suffer fools gladly and was you know, very, very forthright and knew what she wanted. And she said, yep, yeah, fine, marched out, spoke to Ian Fleming, and a call came and they were invited for drinks to Victoria Square. As always with Chopping and Worth Miller, they went along with Bacon. They went to Victoria Square and went in to see uh, Ian Fleming. I have just put these here just to remind everybody because we talk about the wood and the um, flies. Fleming pulled the door open and said, just the man I want to see, dragged Chopping into his study on the left of the door and Bacon and Worth Miller followed the butler and Anne Fleming and when he got drunk in the sitting room. And Fleming then explained exactly what he wanted, which Dickie described was basically everything but the kitchen sink in uh, a, an illustration, which was basically a murder being committed with a gun. And this was to be from Russia with Love. Dickie described how, um, as he was talking, Fleming could simultaneously down a huge gin and tonic, take a huge puff of cigar or cigarette, I don't know which, keep it in his lungs for what seemed like minutes and then jettison as if out of the back of an aeroplane, vertically out of his um, nostrils onto the table, the, these plumes of smoke. But by the end of the meeting, uh, Chopping had got the commission to, to do From Russia With Love. So in the things that are in the archive and that we have in the exhibition here, there was just masses of stuff that wasn't sold. Dickey, claims that he was cheated into selling his works. He certainly sold them everything he had. He thought it was everything, all his first editions signed, signed by Fleming, all the artworks, everything, not that long ago for 2000 pounds to somebody who he believed really, really wanted them. Uh, history will show that the person didn't really want them and they were turned over really quickly in a New York auction house for a considerable amount of noughts on the other end. However, in this show here, here is the star of the show. This guy is going to put everybody to shame in this show. We have the original fly that Chopping used in all those Bond covers and all the other things. He got this guy, he stuck a pin through him, put him in cork. And when I was going through the boxes that I inherited, I found something that just said the fly in a tiny little box that he made. <laughs> I opened it and lo and behold, here we have the fly. And he is here and um, Chopping would put a magnifying glass in front of him and paint him painstakingly. He had him photographed other times and used him over and over. The skull exists, uh, which was given to him by a local doctor called Dr. Kershaw. And we also have a lot of the uh, progressive proofs, they were called, where in those days, one color would be laid down by a printer, then the artist would sign it off, then another color. So quite often there are these proofs which have no color, then there's a rose that, that just has some red in it, then some type comes onto it, and then the wood comes in the background. And we are showing those here. Other things that I found include uh, the original illustrations, uh, for the original covers. And I, I'm embarrassed to say I didn't get it at first. I, I just looked and thought, oh, yeah, yeah, that must be some print or something. And so much was going on, on, on in my life and I was working so, so many long hours at the time, I really didn't realize what I got. And here, I really don't need to explain too much about that. I also have the knife, the playing cards, et cetera, et cetera. Interesting things here that it was so lovely to have 
the, the, the um, so many important brains or two very important brains here yesterday, AJ and Matthew were here and were talking me through things that I don't know about Fleming and picking up things I don't know. This is what Chopping did where he would download again at night and write things down or if he was doing an interview, things to remind himself. And we've got sheets here which talk about Fleming and his relationship with Fleming. Uh, but I do love the way that the things would just end with, say, clocks back. He'd, yeah, he'd write all this really, really important historical stuff of what is now important. But the most important thing to him there is actually remembering the clocks go back. This interested me because we have September 1958 in Dickey's writing, deadline for Fleming. And then here in a letter that I found that was sent from Fleming to Chopping, by March 59, it's already been printed, it's already in a publication as Jacket of the Month. Uh, you know, it, it, it was pretty quick. And then books, just going through um, books, through his um, address books and diaries, there's just so much there. And again, yesterday I learned things that meant nothing to me. I suddenly re realized how important they were. We've got drawings from uh, On Her Majesty's Secret Service, Goldfinger, or the big, big story, a, lo a lovely story here um, with the coat of arms. And um, I've got a, a painting, a, a, a big sheet that's not in this presentation tonight, where Chopping wrote down how he was going to push back to Fleming. Fleming had said what he wanted. And Chopping was saying to him, right, I'm going to push back. I don't want that coat of arms. I don't want the motto underneath and how he's going to do it. And I've gone through and it, it, when I've annotated it, marked Chopping one, Fleming one, Chopping one, Fleming one, or they agreed. And actually the compromise in the end is, or the, I know we have the very, very clever bomb brains here, was that he disguised a lot of the uh, Herald, the, the Bond coat of arms, the fictitious Bond coat of arms, by putting the hand over it. So, the 60s and the 70s, um, art, books, friends, holidays. Chopping had aged, still hell-raising, still enormous fun, still enormously kind. Uh, I mustn't paint the hell-raising side too much, it's just that it entertained me so enormously, but he was a very, very clever, talented, creative man, but also extremely generous. He was taken under the wing of an extraordinary character called Arthur Jeffries. Arthur Jeffries was a partner with Erica Browson in the Hanover Gallery, and then Jeffries took his own studio called Arthur Jeffries uh, in, yeah, surprise, surprise, in um, Davis Street in Mayfair. Arthur Jeffries had uh, a palazzo in St. Mark's Square, and um, here is Arthur Jeffries in his gondola with his gondoliers. And this is the portrait that Graham Sutherland did of, uh, of Jeffries. Sutherland became a mentor also to Dickie and Dennis, and um, through again through um, uh, through Jeffries. Jeffries' life was it was pretty risky. He was he was very out there at a time when it wasn't clever to be out there, and in the end, he killed himself in a Paris hotel. But he was very very generous. He was a, he was a American, he was an heir to a tobacco fortune, but he would take them on holidays. Rolls Royces driven from uh, London all the way across Europe to, uh, to Venice. This is their car going into the front of a plane there. Sunsets in Morocco or markets in Morocco, amazing things. This actually isn't Jeffrey, Arthur Jeffrey's Rolls Royce. That um, is Paul Dancois, who was the star of that film, A Taste of Honey. He was an actor from the Ivory Coast, um, who was a very close friend of theirs, um, and with Peter Pollock, his partner. Then another friend, a close friend, who they had known since 1950, Cecil Beaton, and I include this again here. We've got things here in the show about this, and Cecil Beaton has been featured a lot in this museum and in the galleries here. I love this because um, just a diary thing where lunch with Cecil Beaton is you know, in some ways neither here nor there, but the letter is fabulous, where Cecil Beaton is writing, uh, and I, I must remember to start signing my letters to the bank manager, whatever, blessings, Cecil. I'll do that, blessings, John. But he is asking here how he can get hold of the Nottingham lace curtains that he saw that Dickie had. He's uh, um, Cecil Beaton wants them. And I think if you have Cecil Beaton begging you for some styling, some object to help styling, I think you've absolutely come up in the world. 
Another uh, friend that they, from whom they were more or less inseparable was Sonia Orwell. She married George Orwell on his deathbed. Uh, a lot of people took against her for that. She became a very close friend of Bacon's. Uh, Bacon was very generous to her when she was dying and paid for all her, uh, all her medication and um, hospitalization at the end there. But her and Bacon would come down to Wyvern Hoe, that's the interior of the storehouse again, and spend a lot of time there. However, he wasn't such a great friend because, as we mentioned, it had its ups and downs. He did actually set light to the storehouse, and this is 1963, or his um, friend of the time, uh, George Dyer, who was a bit of an East End uh, gangster, and he went by an East End name of George Davis as well, but his real name is George Dyer, famous for the terrible suicide, uh, which uh, I was able to write about because Dickie told me the true story where they hid the body so as not to ruin Francis Bacon's opening in Paris. It's absolutely outrageous story that they bribed the French police to keep it quiet for 24 hours so that the opening could go ahead. He, George Dyer, flicked a cigarette from the love tree of their home into their uh, kitchen, which was a studio full of, full of flammable stuff. Boom, up goes the artist's home. It was winter, the river was frozen, the farmer couldn't get the uh, hoses to work and uh, they lost the back of the house. Another very influential and important friend is David Hicks. He married Lady Pamela Mountbatten here, um, Lord Mountbatten's um, daughter. There was an incredible wedding in 1961 uh, and um, the uh, it, it, it was January in 61 and the weather was absolutely atrocious. The rain just started and, uh, sorry, the, the snow just started and no sooner had they got into the, uh, into the uh, reception than the generator, the electricity went and then the generators went and Lord Mountbatten stood up and said, I'm very sorry, this isn't going to be able to go ahead. Everybody is, is going to have to get back onto the um, buses. And, and go back and go back to London or get onto the trains, whatever they can do. They, this is Romsey Abbey where they had, had got married and Broadlands was the name of the house where, where they're having the reception. So they all rushed towards the, the, he'd call, the royal family were there, of course, you know, the Queen, Prince Philip, Prince Charles, everybody. Um, and I can't remember how Dickie described it. He described it as um, something like a very orderly scrum as everybody rushed towards to get on the buses, first of all, to get back to London. He, um, he was standing waiting to get onto a bus and the people in front of him said, oh, don't stand behind the bus because if the bus starts and it slips on the ice, it's going to come shooting backwards. And Chopping thought, oh God, I might, I might as well just tell the person behind me. So he turned around and told the person behind him who then he looked at him and realized it was Noel Coward. And at that second, the bus started, shot back and Noel Coward put his hand in his heart and said, you've just saved my life. That bus would have killed me. What's your name? And Chopping said, Dickie Chopping. And Noel Coward went, chippy chopping, chippy chopping, chippy chopping saved my life. And all the way back on the train, every time chopping walked up and down the train, Noel Coward was seen saying, chippy chopping, chippy chopping. And the outcome was they all went for dinner when they got back to Paddington and they were then friends for life. They're invited over to his house in the Caribbean. And um, it was a long lasting life friendship. From David Hicks, what David Hicks would do when he did the Houses of the Great and the Good, he would put in Dennis Worth Miller's paintings or suggest to his clients they bought them. Or this was another line that Chopping had started doing at the time, which were these faces without using the hairline or the jaw. It feature on the inside features of the faces. Now, one of these uh, um, he was using in, um, for, the, for your eyes only was one of the ideas he was working on before the finished thing came through. Uh, and society loved these and it, they became sort of must have society bits, uh, portraits. And he, he ended up selling so many of them, but he, he got sick of them and he stopped. He, it's not what he wanted to do. He was still doing books. Uh, this was um, the book for the 4th of June, which is a book about uh, Eton and for um, David Benedictus. It's one of my favorites actually. It's a, I think it's very, very beautiful. And um, he then was also a writer. Angus Wilson, their great friend, worked really hard with them. It took about 10 years to get this manuscript going. And he wrote and um, illustrated this book called The Fly. 
and even his agent described it as possibly the most disgusting concoction ever put together, but never underestimate the great British public because it was number five in the bestsellers chart for many weeks in 19, summer of 1965. Uh, he, he laughed a bit because somebody told him that the cover when seen in bookshops, people just grabbed it, thinking it was a new Bond book, just grabbed it and bought it. That may have helped enormously. But um, he, he had now had a good reputation as a writer, as well as having been the world's highest paid cover illustrator. That, that was how he's described in New Yorker magazine. He then went on to another book, which wasn't so well received, but I put this in here because Again, it's very interesting. He's got this, he's taking the illustration over the spine here and into the back. And again, we have the flowers and the, the flies here. I, I do just want to go back to this. I mean, that actually is pretty clever for 1965, for a graphic, to get that with no typography on it and to push that through is, um, I think, no mean feat. Chopping hated this one. He it was the last dodo. He published it in America and he changed his name to Boyd because he wasn't proud of it, but he wanted the money. And um, I, I think it's fine. And I, I think it's rather charming, a lot of the stuff, but he, he never liked it. And then uh, in 1981, license renewed. And we've got some uh, illustrations in here, originals from here, but this is exactly where the forensic brains are wanted. He's got the picture of the gun and there are all sorts of uh, serial numbers that are there. Those then are very different here. The Chinese lettering there, I'm not sure what it says, but it's different on the original to um, what comes out there. Here's one of the originals I've got. And interestingly, he's got Fleming at the bottom here and just, um, oops, and just um, renewed across there. Whereas as we know, it had James Bond stamped across it in the stencil typeface. Uh, and another gun where I'm saying for people to look at things, it's gonna be very difficult for people to see, but here he had put the word chopping. He had named the gun chopping. And um, I'm not sure what this was for. It seems to be a, a Bond idea at one stage because there is reference to Fleming having told him to remove the word chopping. <laughs> the friends we mentioned, and these, this is where it starts getting quite extraordinary. Benjamin Britten was a great friend and Peter um, Pierce. And there, there's an illustration from the, uh, the Red House where they lived. Uh, Dickie was teaching at the Royal College of Art. Iris Murdoch was a great friend. Um, as we said, Noel Coward had become a friend. They met um, Sean Connery, the film that came through. But he was also, Chopping was teaching at the Royal College of Art at this stage, as I say, where, later on, that's where I met him. And when he, t when he taught creative writing, he would say to people, right, I want famous people to come in, just tell people how you live, and then the students had to go away. Adam Ant came in, Diana Dawes came in, Frankie Howard. And we were told to go away, get on the bus, go home imagining you are Adam Ant. Open your flat door, get in and have a bath, but you are Diana Dawes, and come back and write what it was like to be that person within a very mundane life. It was, it was a really interesting, clever concept, lovely. With Benjamin Britten, they had a lot of uh, exhibitions and they did um, artworks for the Albra Festival. And then other friends here, Peter Beard, who was a great friend of Francis Bacon's, the wildlife photographer. Here he's written a letter um, with his pictures of Mick Jagger. And he's writing here about how he's been with Andy Warhol and with Bianca, we don't have to guess who Bianca is, and how they're all uh, sincerely wild fans of your work. And then Dickie's writing here going, very surprising news. <laughs> uh, and then Dame Zandra Rose, who is in our audience tonight, um, who is the very, very special friend of um, Dickie's. He was her um, mentor. Zandra sent me a text saying he shaped her career, he shaped my career, and she said we both owe him big time. Wherever Zandra went as her career went just into the, uh, you know, it just escalated and just went into the, you know, out of, I can't find the word, um, but when she, you know, when, as, as she just became so, so famous, everywhere she went, she'd be sending things to Dickie and he absolutely adored her and there's masses of stuff from Zandra there. As we get into the final years, Dickie gave a few interviews, which people may have seen, where he was a little bit waspish about his relationship with Fleming. When he started that with me, I'd say, but come on, Fleming always paid more when you asked for money. You asked for 10, 
you, you were getting paid 10 um, guineas, he gave you 20. When you arrived with the painting and he loved it, he gave you 40. And Dickie would back down a bit then, but people were knocking on his door when he was 83, and they were knocking the door for Dennis to see if there's a Francis Bacon they could get cheap, or if there was a signed edition of an Ian Fleming cover. They just had enough. Every time the door went, it just about always, it was somebody trying to get something. And they were just hacked off with it. And he gave an interview and it was picked up by um, the national newspapers and it was called um, The Man with the Golden Grudge. And it ends with, on a happy note, a civil partnership, um, 2004, two very old men, as you can see. And at the end, they are, this picture I took in the kitchen, there they are re reunited on the potato shelf in their kitchen which I actually feel very happy when I saw that. It made me smile, it made me laugh, which is how it always felt about them. So here we are in the room I'm sitting in now. Here's just a snapshot of some of the things we would love to welcome you to come and see. This is the very beautiful Salisbury Museum. There are the gardens, which have got the cafe and the restaurant outside and the sunshine and lovely things to eat and drink. And we will welcome you with open arms, but we also want to say a huge thank you. Thank you for contributing to this. Thank you for donating. Everything you've given is going towards this absolutely enormous 4.4 million pound refurb that we're just on the cusp of hopefully doing. And um, it, has been, it has been going so well. And it's thanks to people like you and some very, very generous and kind people that we were able to do this. Thank you. I just about, yep, just about right. Kate will now um, kindly, um, uh, will now kindly uh, take questions if people would be good enough to write the questions, uh, please. Uh, I have to stop my share. There we go. I'm back. And I think Kate can now take the questions if people would type them, please. Kate, am I correct in saying that? Yeah, that's right, John. So um, just type your question into the Q&A facility there and I will read them out and pass them on to John. So a um, couple of questions, John, just to start off with. Um, that list of things that annoyed chopping about Lucy and Freud um, quite early in your presentation um, ended with arson. Um, <laughs> do you know what that's related I to? I absolutely do, yes. When um, the East Anglian School was at, um, East Anglian School at Benton End, East Anglian School of Painting and Drawing at Cedric Morris's uh, school, uh, and as I said, Lucy Fry was there as a 16-year-old boy, 17-year-old boy, it was previously at a place called The Pound, which was quite close, which is an old farm, a beautiful old farm. The Pound burnt to the ground um, and uh, Freud was smoking in bed and it, he had always, uh, he didn't deny, and then sometimes he actually quite enjoyed saying uh, things that I've read, saying that um, this was probably due to him smoking, that the whole place went up in smoke. So I think in the hatred, when Dickie went through it, he was trying to challenge the fact that it might have been an accident and that maybe it might have been deliberate. Great, thank you. Um, our one anonymous person has asked, what's your personal favorite work in the exhibition? It is that trompe l'oeil, thank you for that question, but it's, it's funny how I can answer it straight away. It's the trompe l'oeil with the Nina Hamlet playing cards. I absolutely love it. The colours are just so warm. It's slightly bigger than the other ones. It's because it relates to Nina Hamlet, who I adore, and I adore her work, uh, and all the stories I know about her and all the mischief they all got up to. And it encapsulates Fitzrovia and Bond and their friends, and, and it, it's, it's everything. I love it. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, Zelda asks, is there any chance that the wildflower illustrations could get published? How interesting, Zelda. Thank you for that. Um, how interesting, because um, <laughs> just in the last two days, um, there have been a couple of comments about that. So they could, I mean, legally, yes. Um, yes, I mean, that, that's really, really exciting. Um, but how, how very personal, because um, somebody has suggested that um, maybe the, um, we could have a conversation. So um, I'm, I'm all ears for that. So thank you, Zelda. Yes. Thanks. Um, Marcus asks, he says, um, I haven't read The Fly. Um, he says, is it any good? And were <laughs> you surprised that chopping turned to writing? Uh, he, he called, at the end, he called himself a writer rather than an illustrator. He, he didn't want to do illustration. He loved the minutiae of life. He loved the diversity of people. He loved 
everybody from every walk of life and how we all behaved and what we did, as he called this you know, wonderful, gorgeous, beautiful, salacious life. And, and he would write details. I'd find times where he'd been sitting writing about a car park, about how many red cars there were and how many number plates that started with this or that. And he'd, he'd get little bits like that into small pieces that he was writing. And so I wasn't surprised by the time I knew him, he, he was a writer. But The Fly, I, I, I really don't want to be disloyal to my mentor and <laughs> loveliest friend. It is pretty difficult. I had a paperback version, first of all, and the type was, you know, those little paperbacks that is so small and crammed into the pages. It is pretty difficult. I mean, basically, the fly itself sums up everything is annoying and horrible in life. And it's outside and it's, you know, sitting on something pretty foul outside. And then it comes in and lands on the telephone uh, before the lady who's working in the office picks up the telephone. And what the fly has been sitting on is then on the receiver of the telephone. And it's a constant throughout the book and ghastly things are happening all the way through the book and, and this fly is a constant um well, like they are a constant attacker a constant nuisance but it, it, it's pretty it's pretty difficult it's very much of its time i would say so i wish you luck when you get into it <laughs> <laughs> um rosemary asks is it common for the author to commission the artwork for a front cover in uh in the case of Fleming, I, um, um, we mean here um, rather than chopping, doing it for himself. I think from what from what I've learned from what I've inherited from Dickey, Fleming was at this stage famous anyway. He'd, the, the books had done so well before, and in a slightly patronising way, um, they had said that the covers had been done by. Um, let me say, a relative of a managing director. I know there are so many important people on this call tonight that I'm, I'm treading on eggshells here. Um, Chopping didn't think they were very good, but these books have been bestsellers. They've done really well. So I think, Rosemary, the, the answer to that is he was powerful. Um, his publishers would let him really do what, whatever he wanted to do at this stage. And I think when Anne Fleming had gone back and said, I found this person, I think... Fleming realised this was the right person, and and that's where he uh, that's where he just um, I think probably told them what he was going to do. I do have to just say this really quickly. The one thing that I do love is when the gun for from Russia with Love was there. Fleming, because saying this is how much in charge he was, he said, "Right, I know we'll get the gun. I know a dealer in Glasgow. He's got the exact gun. He'll send it down." The gun came in the post, arrived at the chopping studio. The chopping started doing it. He always took a month, two months, maybe to do these drawings. And uh, Fleming phoned him and said, chopping old chap, we've got a bit of a problem. Um, there's been a triple murder, a really grisly murder in Glasgow. They've traced the gun to that um, dealer. And I'm afraid the dealer has said he gave it to Ian Fleming. And he said, I'm afraid I've had to tell him it's gone to rich chopping. And Scotland Yard wanted to know, have you got a firearms license? Which of course the answer was no. And um, so there was a rather sort of nerve wracking few days where they thought they were all going to be up in front of Bow Street magistrates. but again showing how powerful um, Fleming was he said you know with a kind of wave of the arm yep I'll sort it out all done all sorted sorry I, there's so many anecdotes <laughs> I, I just keep going I'll shut up now on that one <laughs> um Mike Anderson's asking uh, was Richard Chopping invited to the Bond premieres and if so did he have any interesting stories he was invited I haven't got any stories from the premieres he was invited to the filming um, and he went down to, in 66, with, um, he went down to Pinewood, uh, eggshells again, and he, they went on the bus and typical chopping, he took Worth Miller, and because Worth Miller went on the coach from London, they took Francis Bacon. And because they were on a coach and there was a bit of a journey there, they'd had a boozy lunch beforehand, so they took some bottles of champagne with them and they had a party on the coach as they went down there. When they arrived at the studios, they more or less fell out of the coach and Fleming was there shaking hands with everybody who was coming off the coach, all the dignitaries and things. And he saw them and he just went, oh God, they must have been scraping the barrel. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but he was, Chopping was delighted because he met Sean Connery and he said how much he liked Sean Connery's wife as well. I'm afraid that Mike is about the only anecdote I've got, but thank you. <laughs> um, an anonymous question. Are there any unpublished manuscripts that Dickie might have liked published? Masses. Masses. Trunkfuls. And there's some really, really good ones. 
that I, I'm sorry. I, I mean, it, it, because there is so much that I've inherited, it, it's one of the areas I haven't got into, but I found an incredible story. Um, he, in 1967, went to the House of Lords for um, to witness, he went with Francis Partridge to witness the bill for the partial dis, um, decriminalization um, of the Homosexuality Act. And um, he has written it all down there and then turned it into a, a novel that includes him and Francis Partridge, it's absolutely brilliant. And then another one, Oscar Wilde, that I found, that there's masses of stuff. That there's some, which is obviously, let's say, work in progress, it's probably not as good, but there's masses of stuff there. Yes, let's um, sort of watch this space. I don't know, I mean, that, not, I haven't got any plans, but I mean, it would be really, it would be so interesting to find out. Yeah, but... Um, Susie uh, says, great talk, John, and lots of positive feedback in the chat, actually, John. Um, she said, uh, she knew more about Chopping's friends, so very interesting to hear more about Chopping. How long did he teach for, and could he not make a life as an artist? He had made a life as an artist. Thank you, Susie. He, he had made a life as an artist, but he gave it up. This is what's so interesting. He, as, as I said, he was the best paid jacket design person. He sat on the underground, on the circle line, going round and round and round just to see his artwork because he was so excited by seeing it. But in the way that a lot of great people do, and some of the greatest people, you see this with comedians, with musicians, when they've got a formula and they walk away from it. I think those are the people, they fascinate me, really interesting. He could have gone on churning out the same old stuff, but he didn't. He really enjoyed teaching. He really enjoyed younger people and students around him. And um, he, it was 65 till 81, it might have been a bit earlier in the 60s, but he was working at Colchester as a teacher before that. The Royal College was, was early 60s till um, 81, but in Colchester during the 50s, he was working there. So all the time he kept a hand in as a teacher. And I just think he enjoyed that so much and he wanted to get on with his writing. And as you can see, their lifestyle changed pretty much for the better. And they went from having no money to being pretty well off and with having some very generous and very, very rich friends. Thank you. Um, AJ Chowdhury, who saw the exhibition yesterday, um, has said, Dickie had such a wonderful hinterland, which you've wonderfully incubated and curated. Um, having been lucky enough to see the exhibition yesterday, the Salisbury Museum has done justice to his work. That's very kind of you, AJ. Um, a very specific question. Where exactly would the Bond covers have been painted? in the um, back room in Wivenhoe in Essex. If you go through the storehouse, their house, there was a courtyard at the back. What they did is they bought two cottages that were adjacent to the courtyard on another little street behind the pub. And one became Dennis's studio and the other became Dickie's illustrating studio and writing studio. And uh, they could keep away from each other, so not fight, because fighting was <laughs> quite on the cards, as you know. And they would go there. It, it was this thing, Zandra taught me this as well, go to work, don't do it in the house. If you can, go to work. So th those were where these um, would have been painted. Thank you. Um, uh, an anonymous question. Was much of Dickie and Dennis's work lost in the fire at Wivenhoe? I think it was. Um, a lot of Kahuna McBride's work was lost, John Minton's work. Uh, a lot of those people that they knew the artists then who are now just so collectible and so interesting, a lot of that stuff was gone. Actually, I do have the exact answer because they were such hoarders or Dickie was such hoarders. I have got the claim of everything that was missing. One that interested me most was a stuffed dog that they valued at 20 pounds, but the stuffed dog was burnt beyond recognition. But there was masses of stuff. And so, so going all the way through the insurance claim, there's a hilarious letter coming back from the insurers saying, we're prepared to accept that this might have been a jackdaw with a cigarette in its beak. Huh? <laughs> so what? <laughs> Midnight, a jackdaw flying over the studio with a cigarette in its beak. Anyway, they paid out, so who cares? <laughs> But um, yeah, a, a lot of stuff, uh, it's, they, they a, a lot of really, really valuable work of their friends um, got lost, historically valuable work. Um, but, but yes, also quite a lot of theirs, I'm afraid. Yeah. Um, Joanna, who's joined us from South Africa. Thank you, Joanna. Joanna hello. Um, <laughs> she asks, um, did Dennis ever feel overshadowed by Dickie? 
interesting pertinent question, Joanna, because um, everybody would say no, because Dennis was with Bacon, and so people would think, well, you know, he, you know, he's got the upper hand, he's with the famous artists and things, but Dickie's success at the beginning, when the book started taking off, and when he got the Bond work, Dennis's career hadn't taken off. And when I said I wasn't going to talk about Dennis in this, it's because it's just so many other stories there. But Dennis's career did take off. And in the 60s, he became incredibly successful. And he painted these beautiful landscapes um, of the marshes and things of East Anglia, and most beautiful things. And he was collected by the, the, the best people, and he went into the best houses. And um, he, he, by that stage, he was fine. But before, yeah, he was very angry and the fights were pretty vicious. I mean, Zandra talks about going in there one day and finding them um, both with knives in their hands at the kitchen. She had to prize them apart. It, it was absolutely bloody when they had a row. And it, from the letters that I've read and the things that I've inherited, Dennis was one of the, well, knowing him, I mean, it, it, it didn't, it, it, it wasn't something he could take easily with this. I think some partners really, are really great when their partner's doing well, and other ones maybe don't do so well. When they were both doing well, I think that was easier. But yes, pertinent question, thank you. Um, there's a couple of sort of uh, related questions, one from Mark, one from Fraser, um, about what Dickie thought, I guess, about uh, the uh, Bond itself. So, you know, what did he think of the Bond movies and their own poster imagery, um, Mark asks, and Fraser asks, um, did Dickie ever share his, his opinion of the Bond novels? Um, did he read them? <laughs> he did. I mean, Fleming said to him, um, when Dickie was doing sort of subservient bit, saying, oh yeah, thank you very much, thank you very much, yeah, I'll take that, I'll read it. And Fleming said, oh, for God's sake, don't read that nonsense. He said, I'll just tell you what to put in it. And I know that's a little bit self-deprecating and things like that, but he, he you know, Dickie did enjoy those, but towards the end, and particularly when he's getting waspish, why he got waspish is people started saying to him, imagine if you got paid a penny for every copy that was sold. And he had got copyright by the stage, copyright laws had changed, but he hadn't um, got a royalty. It didn't happen. I mean, it just didn't happen. But people had wound him up just saying, you know, imagine if you could, you could have given it to your favourite charity. And, you know, he was very keen on the um, RNIB, very keen on autism and children for charities and giving money to people. And, you know, when he'd sue people, it would go just straight to charity. And he got really waspish about things like that. So he would say negative things. But with the films, he felt, I think like a lot of us felt, you know, as we went through the time, that a lot of them were really getting dated and sexist and over-violent. And we had this conversation with AJM Matthew yesterday, which was really interesting. Is Yes, they are still very violent, but look at how everything has diversified and how, how the brand has been, has been contemporized. And that would interest him because, you know, these guys, they loved the way the world changed. You know, when, when punk arrived and exploded, these people loved it. You know, and there's Francis Bacon when Damien Hirst comes along, absolutely adored it. Anything like that. You know, if some, one of the neighbor's children got a Mohican, it was the most exciting thing they'd ever seen. They didn't react like old people were meant to react. They never did. And so, you know, it's, uh, you know, they, they would have loved the way it had changed, but I, th I think, yes, he has said negative things about the Bond films, but I think a, a lot of us have felt like that and we see the reruns over and over. They do seem a little bit, yeah, odd. <laughs> um, just the last couple of questions then. Um, again, a couple slightly related. Is, is the cottage at Wivenhoe still part of the estate and is it possible to visit there? Um, and will we see a show for Dennis's work in the future? Lovely. Um, the my co-executor lives in the house. It's not open, I'm afraid, at the moment, and I don't know what his plans are. Um, but but you know what? I would say a visit to Wivenhoe is well worth it anyway. As one of Dickie's friends said, "There's a whiff of undermilk wood of this place," and there really is still. You know, you walk into the pub and go, "Hello, Mr. So and So. Oh, there's Di the fish. It's, it's just lovely still." And on the front, next door to the house, is the Rose and Crown. Everybody's spilt over the front with their drinks and you walk down the estuary where they used to walk every day. They'd go in the war when there's no food, they'd go and collect gull's eggs from Rat Island and bring the gull's eggs back and eat them with their friends or send them back with their friends to London. All that's still there. I mean, the place has developed and the, the shipyards have gone bust and turned into um, lots of housing, but it's been beautifully done. And it, it's, I think it's well worth the visit, but I'm afraid the house isn't, um, uh, is, isn't a museum. 
Um, the, so what was the second question, Kate? Um, is there likely to be a show of Dennis's work? Yes, thank you for asking that. Yes, there is, and um, work is going on about that at the moment, but I can't say any more than that, um, but yes. Exciting. Yeah, um, because those are big, you know, these are big oil paintings, and um, we've got lots and lots of stuff, so the, yeah. Fantastic. Um, Paula says, were the illustrated flowers ever published? Um, she's asking because she thinks she has one. Woo, Paula. Right, I'm coming straight round. I know where you live. We uh, no, they weren't. Not not the penguin ones. Um, and Sue, who I think is on the uh, uh, on the call uh, today as well, went with Dickie. Sue was one of his favourites, um, favourite friends, and one of his students, like myself. She went with Dickie when he donated most of the originals to Q. But as there was so much stuff. I've inherited some of the other ones here. We've got the originals here, some of the originals, probably about a dozen, and we've also got the proofs. But those proofs for Penguin didn't go into print, but there may have been other ones, um, Paula, I don't know. Um, I, yeah, I haven't got any books of his that, that have those other than when it's with insects and butterflies and things like that. But you've set me a task now, I will answer that, <laughs> I'll find out. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I think we probably have to, to okay. go to a last question now. Yeah, I know you um, need to get home. Yes, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone else is home, you see. That's Night the in the museum, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, Sue has asked, um, are there uh, prints available of Dickie's paintings? Well, Kate, you are the lady who's turned around <laughs> the wonderful shop here. And there's, Kate is the lady who managed to get this shop to turn around and increase year on year during lockdown. Now, Kate, will there be any prints? <laughs> um, well, we certainly have the exhibition poster available to purchase and we have um, 10 postcards and two greetings cards and a postcard concertina, a little notebook. So we, we've done a, a very nice small range of um, reproductions of a lovely quality. Um, which I think are a very nice memento of the exhibition. Could I say one thing um, that's very important that um, AJ pointed out to me yesterday is these have never ever been available um, because we've never given permission. And because this is a charity and we're working to grow this museum is what Dickie would have wanted. That sounds a little bit um, soppy, I know he's dead. But um, it's, it's right, we want to help this charity um, and we've given them here for that very reason and they have never been um, used before and probably won't again. So um, they are here and they're, they're beautiful. Everybody who's been on the call, it's been so, so enjoyable to do and you've really made it very special for us. So thank you, thank you for your donations and um, we really want to see you here, please. Yep, thank you so much, John. That was absolutely incredible presentation i really enjoyed it and i, I although I've, I've read your book which of course you've not mentioned <laughs> uh, which has told me a lot i think this, this presentation really just was an eye-opener as well so it's been wonderful thank you so much for doing it we thank, you for doing that. Really appreciate well, thank, thank you everybody and um really hope to see everybody soon bye-bye night night bye.